All right, thank you. Thank you, everybody. It's been a long day, and I appreciate you coming and spending a little more time with me. So I want to thank you because it's late and uh, it's been an hour for everybody, but thank you so much for coming. I'm Steve Hassan, and I have been doing this work for 48 years. I actually got recruited into the Moonies 50 years ago uh, as a college student and dropped out of college, quit my job, donated my bank account, was told to throw out all my original poetry as a demonstration of my faith in God, cut off from my family, was trained to think that democracy was satanic, and evil and fasted for Nixon during Watergate because <laughs> the Messiah Moon said that God wanted Nixon to be president even though he was a corrupt. So that, that's an introduction for those who haven't heard of me before or I've, I've been talking about this for 48 years. But um, I decided to title this talk um, combating cold mind control throughout the world in 2024, because I feel like we're at a moment of existential significance. And I used to think undue influence was the second most important issue on the planet and global climate crisis was number one until I read a book called The Parrot and the Igloo um, by David Lipsky, who I interviewed recently on my podcast, The Influence Continuum. And this was a book on climate science denial, uh, starting from the 1800s, I might add. It was a very well-researched book. But it turns out the Moonies, my former cult, has been at the center of global climate science denial for 50 years. So, as a former leader of this cult, I'm pissed. <laughs> I am just outraged that this cult still exists and that it has so much political power. Uh, and I'm gonna go through the slides pretty quickly, but I, but I really want to tell you that I feel like those of us in the room who have experienced the loss of our freedom are in a unique position to help everybody else in the world who doesn't understand that the mind can get act, that people can be brainwashed to believe ridiculous, insane things and follow malignant narcissists around the world. And what's so different over these decades is the internet, social media, AI, supercomputers, and basically state actors that want to destroy any regulations, any rule of law. And it's, um, I feel like we're in a unique position to help educate the planet on this important topic. So that, that's the frame. And I'm, I'm gonna give lots of time for questions and answers. But I typically, when I do a talk, I'm used to standing and pacing, but we're doing a streaming thing, so forgive me. But um, I think it's this way. I always like to start a talk by asking the audience, typically not of X members, but how would you know if you were under mind control? <laughs> Because I was in two and a half years and I met a lot of people and they tried to tell me I was brainwashed and mind control that I was in a cult. And the, the, the thing is, the, so the thing is, is that when, when it happens to you, your operating system got hacked. So you don't have the perspective to think objectively about what's happening. And it's not that unlike when you click on a deceptive link and malware gets installed on your computer and it takes over your operating system. And, 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 and I'll have a few slides, but it, this is the central question. And I do, I have a formula that I'm going to propose for how to know. 
I did a TEDx talk on, on the subject, but it's really important to, to understand that 90% of everybody walking around thinks erroneously that only weak, stupid people could be brainwashed. Never happened to me because I'm an extra honor student and I was reading postgraduate level when I was eight, which is true, and skipped eighth grade, but it happened to me. So, um, and this is just a tiny, and I, it, I, I'm stunned that a lot of young people, when I say I was in the Moonies, they're like, who? Yeah. They, because the cult has gotten so powerful in the media, you don't hear anything about it, except for us former members, right, Helena? Uh, us former members who, you know, speak out in the media and tell our stories. But Moon had the Guinness World Book record for um, a simultaneous mass wedding. He did 35,000 couples at one time, all members, and he would line the men up and the women up and he'd go, you and you, you and you, you and you. And everybody believed he was tuned into God and he knew everything about everybody. He was a sinless Messiah. And he knew, and this was all about blood purification. Why? Because Adam and Eve had sex with, the, with Satan, the archangel, and all of humanity fell away from God, and all of human history is to bring the Messiah to purify everybody. And when Moon took over the world, everyone would speak Korean, by the way. <laughs> you didn't know that. But literally, every single, every single uh, suit and every single wedding dress were the same, and everyone had to pay for it. It was a big money maker for the cult. So Moon died in 12, 2012, and his wife took over as the figurehead of the main cult. I should say I have on my website uh, a list of front groups of the Moonies. It's 71 pages, single-spaced. This is not a small group. It's a multi-billion dollar international conglomerate. Two of his sons are at war with the mother, thinks she's the whore of Babylon. This is one of the sons, um, Sean Moon. I can mix this. Um, and he has a cult called the Rod of Iron Ministries.org. If you want to get, have a nightmare, you can go and watch him talk about how uh, in Revelation, the Rod of Iron is an assault rifle. AR-15, and conveniently, his brother Justin happens to have an arms factory making AR-15s as well as pistols, and they have two training centers for civil war in Tennessee and Waco, Texas. Um, and Sean brought busloads of Moonies the January 6th insurrection, was messaging it was Antifa, the Moonies newspaper, the Washington Times, yeah, they were saying it was Antifa also. Um, so I'm pretty pissed off. And, you know, this this group is really, oh, I should say Mrs. Moon gave Trump $2.5 million <laughs> to endorse the group a few weeks after that January 6th um, insurrection coup attempt. And, um, so for, for those cult um, propagandists that say there's no such thing as brainwashing or mind control, this has been in the Diagnostic Statistical Manual of the American Psychiatric Association for decades as a dissociative disorder. And those who can't read it, I will just say identity disturbance due to prolonged and intense coercive persuasion. Individuals who've been subjected to intense coercive persuasion e.g. brainwashing, thought reform, indoctrination while captive, torture, long-term political imprisonment, recruitment by sects or cults, or by terror organizations may present with prolonged changes in or conscious questioning of their identity. So when I wrote Combating, this is the updated version, but when it first came out in 1988, 
I described my experience as like John John and John Colt member. Like there was two of me. There was the real Steve Asson and the Mooney Steve Asson. And the Mooney Steve Asson took over and suppressed the real Steve Hassan. And, um, and, and many family members and friends note that when somebody gets recruited by one of these groups, um, there's a radical personality change. Different pace, different words, different behaviors, and it can switch like a light switch sometimes, and it confuses the public. So educating family and friends is really important. So I, I'm, I'm going to do the slides quickly, and then I'm going to do my uh, extemporaneous talk, which I did not um, outline because that's I just and I should say people say. Did you get anything good out of the Moonies, Steve? I say, you know what? I was such a shy, introverted bookworm before the Moonies when I was, uh, I was a creative writing major. When I had to read poetry in front of 20 students, I would like have a panic attack. And then I'm in the Moonies and I'm getting up and giving lectures to hundreds of people. And when I got out, I was like, I think I can still give lectures in front of people and go on TV. And I'm, I'm really going to use something that I learned. Anyway, I think it's important to understand this graphic because the public may be exposed to the fringest of members and go, there's nothing wrong with them. They're completely normal. But for me, when I'm thinking about an authoritarian mind control cult, I'm looking at the pyramid, particularly the core devotees. That's, that's what I'm looking for, for criteria. Um, so this next slide is probably the single most important slide for me in terms of asking all of you who want to educate your friends, your family, other ex-members, uh, legal systems and such, because from the moment we're born, we're influenced by everything. That's where learning organisms, really. But to understand as ethical <laughs> guidelines and values, and it's a continuum, it's not a binary, to unethical influence. Like, Legitimate religious groups, in my opinion, they honor informed consent. And I used the argument, I was doing a counterterrorism uh, <laughs> meeting at the Aspen Institute with the US State Department um, in 2015, because they wanted to understand how ISIS was recruiting online. And I said, well, I call my company Freedom of Mind because I've learned in the Abrahamic religions, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, they all share the Garden of Eden story, however they want to understand it. But in that story, Almighty God didn't brainwash Adam and Eve to be obedient and dependent. And it tells us an important message, however you understand the divine or spirituality, that we need to have choice. We need to say no. We have to be able to ask questions. And that's what a healthy religious group is about. And I think Frederick Clarkson, who is a, a, a journalist, still is a journalist, he interviewed me when I got out of the Moonies and he, and he said, you know, Steve, um, the Moonies infringed on your religious freedom when they lied to you and said they weren't religious. You know, because if you knew what they were actually teaching, you never would have gotten involved. And I'm like, damn, you're so right. Because the cults like to use religious freedom, religious freedom. I'm, I'm free to lie to you and trick you and hypnotize you and brainwash you. And I say, no, you're not. That should be a crime. It should be a crime. So there are many more criteria on the, the ethical side that I could expand individuality, you know, individual uh, influence. Um, and of course, domestic abuse is on the 
unethical side. But um, many of you know uh, that when I wrote my book, actually when I did my, my first master's dissertation, I learned about Leon Festinger, his book, When Prophecies Fail. It's the cornerstone of cognitive behavioral therapy. He was talking about cognitive dissonance, thoughts, feelings, and behaviors and how human beings like to be congruent between their behaviors and their thoughts and their feelings. And if you can get people to do extreme behaviors, you can get them to change their beliefs and rationalize it and feel good about it. And I was like, I wonder if I could use those three things to take Lipton and Singer and Shine and West's models and think about how I was recruited, how I recruited and indoctrinated other people. And I started listing the behaviors under behavior control, uh, you know, a thought control, emotional control. So if anyone got the original combating book and the original book had a horrible picture on the cover, I was so angry at my publisher. It was a bald headed guy with a, with a chain around his head and a master padlock over his ear. I was like, no one's going to buy this book with that. I would never buy a book like that. In any case, um, but I, and so when the original book didn't call it bite. It was in a different order. But the, the other piece that I needed to add was information control, because human beings live by taking in information through our senses, through our stories, through our words, because that information is what makes us adapt and change and grow and connect with each other. And I credit uh, a, a, a minister friend of mine, Buddy Martin from Texas. We did a lot of Boston Church of Christ case. He said, you know, Steve, you can change the order to bite, and then people can remember it. <laughs> well, I'm like, damn, buddy, that's a great <laughs> Can I call it the bite model? He's like, yeah, of course you can. <laughs> so, great guy. So, the point is with this, with this, the unethical side is the bite model. And it's a very long list. It's all on my website for free, go to freedomofmind.com. You can literally click a link and download all the behavior control, sleep deprivation, change of name, clothing, rigid rules and regulations, uh, uh, telling people where they have to live, who they can be with. And people can just go through the list and bing, 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 and, and then information control and thought control and emotional control. So they can self-assess. How would I know if I'm under mind control? They have a tool. And for me, I'd like to see this graphic in every bathroom, like they're, you know, are you a victim of domestic violence? Call 911. It's like, Let's teach people how to evaluate what's healthy influencers. Like they are transparent, they are trustworthy, they're accountable, they're psychologically healthy versus the malignant narcissist who's a pathological liar and thinks they're above the law, Trump, uh, and other, other authoritarian leaders around the world. It, it really becomes formulaic. And when I wrote Combating in 1988, trust me, I didn't know that much. I'd only been into it in a half years, and I knew what I knew. But the patterns that I identified, people are still contacting me to this day, telling me about groups I've never heard of. And they're like, wow, how did you know that you were describing my group? And I'm like, because there's a formula for authoritarian mind control cults. It's not, it's not rocket science and it's different, but you, but to understand and, and former members, one of the universal issues is an inability to trust, right? Trouble trusting yourself, trouble trusting a, a, an organization, <clears throat> trusting another human being. Well, if you can internalize the graphic and have understand malignant narcissism i have two slides on that coming up uh and such 
you have an internal mechanism that you can evaluate anything. And reality tests. You need to have a little assertiveness to ask direct questions, but you can learn to trust yourself. Be your own best friend. Be your own teacher. Be your own therapist. I, I, I really, I really want to um, add, I wanted to add these two slides because if you understand these, this slide and the next slide, you will protect yourself from 80% of every bad actor, maybe 90% because it's so formulaic. The, 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 so this is all on my website also guys. And this is from Eric Fromm, social psychologist. He was, he came up with this list because he was trying to understand Hitler. This is the path, th these are the characteristics he came up with. Grandiose self-centered behavior, fantasies of power, success and attractiveness, need for praise and admiration because they have a hole in their self-esteem because they basically have an attachment disorder. Super sense of entitlement, everyone exists to serve them and lack of empathy. And this, when I was working with sex trafficking survivors developing a program called Ending the Game, one of the critical pieces that, 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 that these women were, in some cases girls and underage girls, were missing was they thought the pimp loved them. You know, and when I was able to explain, no, if you don't have empathy, you're incapable of love. Oh, but he said he loved me. It's like, yeah, words. And he's very certain and, you know, they're good talkers and they're very good flatterers. But pay attention because if somebody's lacking empathy, warning, warning. And then this is the psychopathological dimensions. Uh, thinking you're above the law, uh, what do you call it, antisocial behavior, pathological lying, interpersonally exploitative, sadistic, harassing and silencing. Trump's threatening to try Liz Cheney for treason. If he ever gets into power again. <coughs> um, violence, paranoia, inability to trust friends. So, and teach your children this stuff. The, most, the best thing you can do is inoculate. And, and, and on that topic, I really think describing mind control as a virus really works in the age of post-COVID. We need to have a public health emergency. The, you know, we need to inoculate people to be able to understand how to protect their own minds. We need intervention. Mental health professionals, I've heard it over and over again this meeting, are not trained on how to identify someone who's in an authoritarian mind control relationship or cult, or much less how to treat uh, them. And in addition to intervention, recovery services. There's no rehab centers in the United States anymore. There used to be Wellspring and Meadowhaven. Nada. And there are tens of millions of people who've been radicalized a, a lot online, through the media, and through bad um, a lot of politicians, I might add. But we we can tell our stories if you're if you're ready to tell your story, to destigmatize it. Like we did the best we could with the information and experiences we had at the time. They lied to us. They tricked us. They manipulated us. They used social psychology. It's not on us. They were the bad actors. We were trusting. We were idealistic. We were responding to someone we thought were, loved us or were flirting with us and we were lonely or whatever. But the, the, the thing is, is I really feel like former members and those family and friends of former members were in a unique moment in the world where we need to be teaching the public about psychology and social psychology and about hypnosis and the difference between ethical hypnosis and unethical hypnosis, because it's all over the internet hypnosis. 
So about um, seven years ago, I got involved with a forensic think tank at Harvard Medical School. A forensic think tank are people who are psychiatrists, psychologists, and lawyers who interface with the legal system. So they become expert witnesses. And I, because I, I was thinking, you know, I'm an activist for 40 years and things are getting worse. And the law is about 100 years out of date with understanding what we know about the human mind and about people. And the law has to get updated. So I got involved with this forensic think tank. I did a presentation, not unlike this one. And one of the professors said, you need to go do a doctorate and you need to do a quantitative study on your bite model. And I said, I'm too old, I'm 63. And he said, I'm 77. You want to change the law or don't you? <laughs> if you do this thing, I'll supervise your research. So I did it. This is the dissertation. And I created a, literally a roadmap for anyone who is involved with law enforcement and the law. Uh, as well as therapy, I took Lifton's model, Singer's model, Shine's model. I connected it to trafficking law, which is fraud, force, or coercion. I connected the dots with those things. And I should add that labor trafficking experts in the US and sex trafficking experts love the bite model because it fleshes out deception and manipulation and sleep deprivation. It just it gives all the granular detail. Um, then my dear departed friend, Alan Shefflin, who was uh, president of ICSA, he was a law professor at Santa Clara Law School. I contacted him in 1978 when I read his book, The Mind Manipulators. It was one of the first two books on MK Ultra. He had done uh, FOIA requests to get information about the CIA mind control research projects of the 50s and 60s. And I reached out to him and he was happy to talk with me and he befriended me. And it's really his influence to say, Steve, call it undue influence. Brainwashing doesn't work in the law. Undue influence is a 300 year old concept, uh, British common law. Da, 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 da. So you, he passed away last year of a stroke, but I, he created a social influence model that experts can use to describe to judges and juries or to your friends. You're on a, the influencee and their unique vulnerabilities. Maybe they, the, they had uh, death in a, uh, of a loved one, an illness, uh, graduation, losing a job, uh, accident, uh, moving to a new city, state, situ what we call situational vulnerabilities. The influencer or the predator or the predatory organization, their characteristics, like the malignant narcissism I was just talking about, and the who, what, when, where, and how, and the consequences of, because it's social influence, right? It's not a psychiatrist saying, are you psychotic? and looking into an individual? No, social influence is about a dynamic interaction. You have to look at all of these variables. So I added his model into my dissertation because then you have a framework to be able to say, okay, we've got the Chinese communist brainwashing models here. We got the trafficking law, which is international, uh, internationally illegal. Now we have the law professor's model for how to explain predator and prey in a granular way that makes sense. And then I did my, my uh, quantitative study on the bite model. And we had over a thousand participants going through all the criteria from none on a Likert scale from never to always. And guess what? We had a 0.9 factor analysis for authoritarian control. But it also makes sense. If you can control someone's behavior, information, thoughts, and feelings and make a new identity that's dependent and obedient, 
Yeah, <laughs> that sounds like authoritarian control. And whether somebody calls it, you know, religion or not. So um, I bought the rights back to combating in 2014. Uh, I wasn't allowed to put Scientology into the original edition. I asked my good friend John Atak, the world's foremost authority on Scientology. I said, John, would you edit the book and add everything you can that you think is important about Scientology into this? And all of the weaknesses of the book, like I didn't know about the Jehovah's Witnesses or the Mormons were cults until the book came out and I started getting deluged by former members and former elders. And I got deluged by people saying, Steve, you were recruited at 19, but I was born into it. I don't have a real me. And I was like, you're right. What, what do I do with that? And I just started to figure out that in and this is where I still am at this point I really think people are born with an authentic self like when when you're a baby you have DNA but there's there's an essence of you and no matter if you didn't have the life experiences I just met so many people born into cults that ran away as soon as they could they, they, you know, they report they just never liked it. They didn't believe it. They saw the hypocrisy or whatever. So I, I think we all have an authentic self. I, I can't say there's an evidence-based structure for how to evaluate that. I just know it from doing this work for so many years. So we added terrorism, we added people born into cults, trafficking, <laughs> and Mormons. Yes, Steve, did you want to say? I think you're making a really important point there, Steve. Well, thank you, about the uh, born with an authentic self. I wouldn't put it that, point that way, but it's a fact that, we are, that people are born with different temperaments. One of those, and one aspect, one characteristic of a born temperament is willingness to explore. That is a temperament characteristic. I'm going to try to repeat for the for the audience because I'm not. But so, uh, former president of ICSA, forensic psychologist Steve Eichel, who did his dissertation on deprogramming, how's that for a plug? Uh, <laughs> said that he he believes that people are born with temperaments, and that human beings want to explore. They want to grow. They want to learn. They want love. They want love, they want safety, they want attention. And what we're learning is that we, we have mirror neurons and healthy children need that physical contact and interaction with humans. They're not getting it from iPads, they're not getting it from smartphones, and it's rewiring our youth in a very destructive way that I'm gonna go back to social media and the internet, but. The, 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 if you haven't read the new combating, you might want to check it out. I did Freedom of Mind. That's my model for the strategic interactive approach to how to help empower people to start reflecting and reevaluating. It's not to persuade people that they're in a cult and they have to get the hell out of there. It's about sharing on, in a respectful, interactional way and there's a formula of rapport and trust building and asking questions and getting information, building perspectives. I have a three-step phobia intervention. And a lot of former members still have phobias and anxiety disorders that are untreated. And what people typically do when they have a phobia is they avoid the stimulus. So people leaving a Bible cult won't pick up a Bible or they won't go into a church or someone in a yoga cult will never do yoga again. I say it's your mind. You should control it. And you should think about what you want. And if you like yoga or you like meditation, undo the triggers, reassociate them or do a different type of meditation. But like be in your body, be in the here and now. Have a locus of control inside your body. Have a positive future orientation. Oh, that's the that's the QR code, but it's also on my on the um, my cards that are everywhere. 
So I'm going to just go back to the that one and leave that up while I riff for another 15, 20 minutes. And then I like to do questions and answers because honestly, I, I, I'm tired of hearing myself talk. <laughs> and there's a lot of wisdom in this room, you know? So um, I'm going to tell you briefly that when I got the program from the Moonies as a leader, I had all these internal documents from, from meetings that I was attended with Moon. They were unedited, printed by the group about how he's going to take over the world, how he's going to destroy democracy. And once one, and for those of you who don't know my story, I fell asleep at the wheel of a van, drove into the back of a truck, the trailer truck at 80 miles an hour, was rescued from the wreckage. It didn't blow up. I was in the hospital away from the group and sleeping. I was sleeping three to four hours a night, seven days a week for two and a half years. I had two weeks of sleep and, and convalescent, convalescent, and the group didn't visit me other than one hour visit in the very beginning. And I called my sister, who I was very close with growing up with. She was the one person in my family that didn't say I was in a cult and I was brainwashed. Everyone else was like, trying to argue me out of it. Steve, get your cult. What's wrong with you? Are you stupid? True parents, true parents. Glory to heaven, peace on earth. Glory to heaven, peace. Crush Satan, crush Satan. Chanting and uh, thought stop in the group. Anyway, so I, I agreed to a deprogramming because I wanted to prove to my family I wasn't in a cult and I wasn't right. <laughs> Why did I agree? Because my father cried and said, How would you feel if it was your son who met a controversial group and dropped out of college, quit his job, and you didn't see him again? How would you feel? But it was the tears my father really cared about. Then the cult voice came in. Oh, but he was brainwashed by the communist media, you know. But I, I could feel he really genuinely was worried. And I wanted to prove that I wasn't in a cult. So I agreed. And that's where I learned about lifting. I met with ex-members, one of whom I recruited into the movies, who had gotten out before me, and I knew she was a wonderful human being, and I woke up and got out. That That's a whole other story, and it could go on, on and on, but what I want to share in this talk about mind control in 2024 is I get, I get out, my, I have a cast from my toes to my groin, I'm on crutches, I'm all banged up, I'm ashamed, I'm embarrassed, I'm totally confused, but I knew that what I had gotten into was evil. And I felt guilty. There's a man I was, who talked her, uh, the other day about growing up in the children of God and how guilty he felt. I felt so guilty. So I said to my father, I have these speeches. You should really go with a police officer and try to get the material. And I gave it to a congressional subcommittee investigation that was looking into Korean CIA activities in the United States because the number two man at the embassy defected. And I'm, I, this is a longer story, but I'm trying to condense it to the essentials to make my point about mind control in the 2024. Um, so, and, and, and the Moonies had threatened to kill me. I had phobias up the wazoo. I was taken to see the exorcist movie and Moon said that God made the exorcist. This was a prophecy of what would happen if you left the church and everything like that. But I, I basically said to the, the head, um, investigator, I'm happy to talk to you, but please don't put me on the stand. I want, I don't want to be assassinated. And I truly believe that. Um, and so, but I naively thought that this investigation was going to shut down the moons. <laughs> October 31st, 1978, rolls around the final report, 80 pages of the, I think it's 300 pages, was on the moonies. 
So I'm reading, reading ACIA, interesting. Da, 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 da. And guess what happened 18 days later? Anyone remember? Jonestown. Jonestown. Mm -hmm. Congressman Ryan was assassinated. He was on that committee. I'm looking at the bodies face down in the jungle. I'm going, I would have done that. I would have killed them. I would have taken the gun and shot the congressman if I had been ordered to. That's how far gone I was. And I cried. Senator Bob Dole asked me to come to D.C. and be part of a congressional hearing with a survivor of the People's Temple. I flew to D.C. and the Moonies are picketing. And I'm taken off the agenda. And the president of the Moonies is invited to speak instead. And I said, what the F? What the F is going on here? And the, my, my, my idealism, my, my faith in the U.S. government was like, wow. So I read the investigation. It was 11 volumes. And the most significant thing I want to share with you was the deposition of the founder of the Korean Central Intelligence Agency, who said, I organized and utilized the Unification Church for use as a political tool, unquote. And what I came to understand is, well, North Korea brainwashes, South Korea had two unsuccessful coups. They were worried about destabilization of South Korea. So some a-hole, I was going to use a different word, at the CIA said, let's set up a Korean CIA, let's set up a proxy group that can do counter brainwashing programs in South Korea to stabilize the regime. And the Moonies were selected. And Colonel Bohe Park was the CIA, Korean CIA liaison person. And so what I'm trying to say to you is MK Ultra, MK Ultra 2.0 or 3.0 was me. And I understood, and I should say the CIA tried to recruit me three separate times. They said, we want to learn how to deprogram terrorists, Steve, would you come work for us? And I was like, I think I've had enough with, you know, organizations. That's a little distrustful. But what I what I came to understand is as there was a Cold War run up of nuclear weapons, there was a, a simultaneous one, the search for mind control how to hypnotize people, how to manipulate them emotionally, how to get them to do what you want them to do, how to control the citizenry. And it's been going on ever since. It's getting more and more sophisticated with more and more sophisticated models. <coughs> and we're living at a moment in time because of the internet and social media where mass populations are being brainwashed with just BS. There's no such thing as global climate change and outside there's massive floods. <laughs> the glaciers are melting. The fires are going on and burning up everything. But And who is doing this? The fossil fuel industries and countries that want to keep selling. And they used the Moonies for 50 years to do climate science to know. And they're still doing it. So I'm coming back to my original comment, which is the people in this room have a unique position to be able to say, this is real. It wasn't me. It's this whole process that was being done. Different groups, different situations. But the same BITE techniques, breaking people down, remolding them in the image of the group, uh, refreezing those uh, and deploying those people. And um, furthermore, I'll go, did I, what I mentioned before about the Aspen Institute and countering ISIS, yeah, I talked about freedom of mind at that meeting. Well, another interesting thing at that meeting was there was a uh, an AI system that was shown to us. 
or this man who developed this, uh, it monitored open source information in 20 languages in real time. And he had been hired to figure out how is ISIS recruiting online? He brought five different screens and he's, he, he puts <laughs> Madeline Albright, who was in the room, puts her name and, um, and we could see everything she posted online and what people were saying, 20 languages about Madeline Albright in real time. And, and, and so this man, who's Nova Spivak, said, if you want to understand how ISIS is doing what they're doing, think of STDs. And we're looking at each other. STDs? <laughs> Yeah, sexually transmitted diseases. Sexually transmitted diseases. He said, yeah, the more sex you have with someone who has syphilis, the more likely you are to get it. That was his metaphor. He said, we track people, one of these front organizations, whether it's video gaming or matchmaking service or language service or this or that, and we can track how people swarm. That's the computer term for love bombing. But it can be with bots online and systematically interacting and nudging them and then getting them to go to a different location that's more uh, secure, showing them YouTube videos or videos that they are then start indoctrinating people, keeping them up all night long because these meetings are too important. And by the way, if you don't know it, humans need seven to nine hours of sleep to function properly. So average eight. Most people are sleep deprived. Most people are sleeping six or less. And, and, and young people are bringing their phones into their bedroom at night and they're staying up all night. This is not, this is, this is the ultimate brainwashing device right here. And I know BJ Fogg at the Stanford Persuasive Lab that he, he taught Google and Facebook and everyone else how to, like Pavlov's dog with the ringing of the bell, how to get those likes and how to keep getting those little dopamine surges to keep people addicted. And I was on Aza Raskin and Tristan Harris's podcast, Your Undivided Attention. They're some of the few people that are soundly alert with AI and social media. And Aza feels guilty because he created doom scrolling. If you don't know what that term is, it's when you say to yourself, I think I'm going to go on Instagram for five minutes. And then two hours later, you're like, wait a minute. I had work I had to do. I, I meant to go to sleep two hours ago because it's that powerful. And I'm saying to all of you, we need to control our own minds and bodies. We need to realize technology is supposed to serve us. We're not, and, and, and with Americans, there's no data privacy. You know, the Mercers made Cambridge Analytica, they hacked Facebook, they got millions of people's uh, details. There's now 5,000 data points on every voting American. And that's not including Chinese hacks of major banks and, 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 and major corporations and Experian and all the rest. So these, these profiles are online and there's a company that I'm aware of, there's probably more, but there's at least one, there's a documentary made about it in Colorado called GLOW, G-L-O-O, -O, and they will sell data on people to cults. They can sell data. Who's depressed? Who's searching depression or, or, or anxiety attacks? And they can put these through supercomputers and they are, they can create formulas. And all of a sudden the person is getting a message, come to our Bible study. Let's play volleyball together. Or you look pretty cute. I saw your picture online. You want to go out with me? 
This is what's happening in 2024, people. It isn't, you know, recruiting on college campus in person anymore. It's happening online in mass. Um, so how are we going to stop it? Well, being aware of the techniques. Do you know that, that Trump got $2 billion worth of free advertising in his first presidential um, campaign? $2 billion. <laughs> It's, I can't prove it, but I believe his people bought that system that Nova Spivak showed. Because I said to Nova, you know, there's a presidential election next year. This is really powerful stuff. Because he described mimetic warfare was how he could stop ISIS online. Tracking memes. And he said, if a meme is getting too strong, you create another story that distracts people and create a different meme. So I said to him, there's a presidential election, Nova. He said, oh, Hillary's people only want to pay us $10,000 a month. I can't pay my electrical bills for that. And I said, Nova, I hope you're not going to go to the dark side. He said, I don't want to go to the dark side, but I have partners. And then he disappeared and he sold his company. And guess what? Trump would say one outrageous thing, then another outrageous thing, and another outrageous thing, and people were talking Trump, 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 Trump. And what we now know about the human mind is repetition. Even if it's negative, it still imprints a person's name in your head. By the way, you know what his real name is? His given his family name? Trump. D R U M P F. Think he could get elected with a name like Trump? <laughs> I interviewed uh, uh, Craig Unger and Yuri Schmetz, a former KGB official who came to the United States when the Soviet Union defected. A book called American Compromise. I have a lot of interviews. I started a podcast. If you're interested in this stuff, post mm -hmm, the cult of Trump. Anyway. Yuri said, oh, we, we recruited Trump decades ago. Huh? As an asset. Huh? Yeah, through Ivana. Huh? You mean the, the former president of the United States was recruited by Russia as an agent? And yeah, he said. Uh-huh, of course. He said, any American businessman that came to the Soviet Union they pair up some beautiful Russian women. They take photo, you know, videos. They offer money and expense paid this and that. And if you if you look objectively, Putin was a KGB official. He was raised in an authoritarian cult of the Soviet Union. I should also say I was asked to come to Moscow when the Soviet Union fell by psychologists and psychiatrists. I think it was 92 or 93 that they flew over there. They, want, they said, there's a lot of Western cults coming in. We want to know what's going on with them. So I'm explaining the model. I'm going to do a little bit of Russian accent. Forgive me. My, my grandmother on my father's side is from Moscow, so I don't title. <laughs> anyway... So I'm explaining mind control and they're like, excuse me, Dr. Hassan, do you understand you're describing the whole system of pedagogy of the Soviet Union? <laughs> Dr. Hassan, do you understand we would put political dissidents into psychiatric facilities because they were criticizing the regime? <laughs> Dr. Hassan, you're, you're describing young pioneers in Komsomo. Uh-huh. Oh, so you are counseling us. <laughs> and I said, if the shoe fits. <laughs> and it really is a mind control cult. <laughs> Dual identity, except they know that it's an authoritarian version. It's, it, it, it's, it's different when you're born into that. But if you're born into that, it's like people who are born into cults, you don't know what normal is. 
you don't know like what what is what would it be like to have like a healthy family that encourages you to ask questions and make mistakes and all of that you don't know and people leave these authoritarian countries and unless they do their homework and do their psychological healing they're former cult members and the way i see it and they're vulnerable they're following the next authoritarian dictator so we're in at war whether you know it or not it's kinetic in ukraine it's kinetic in in uh, israel and gaza but psychological warfare is what's happening right now and a lot of people that i meet say i can't even watch the media anymore i can't go online anymore and i'm like you're very smart like you need to regulate your own mind and your own emotions and you don't need to hear every detail of every trauma and and disaster around the world you don't need to hear that all day long this is not healthy you need joy you need music you need creativity you need fun and nature walking in the in nature breathing air and not just fixating on screens and 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 we have a choice we can evolve or we can devolve and i refuse to to give up and i refuse to go give into pessimism or, or you know uh it's inevitable it's like not inevitable but they want us to be confused and disoriented and helpless and hopeless and <laughs> Let someone else deal with it. I'm going to binge watch movies or I'm going to play video games. It's like, no, pony up. This is this is it. We, we got to mobilize masses of people to be good citizens and realize there's been a 50 year, you know, long planned process. And I come back to the Moonies because I lived it. I was in the freaking room and now they're trying to do what I heard from Moon's lips right now in the United States government. It's like, okay, knock, knock. And if we care about our children, our grandchildren, our cousins, our aunts, if we care about creatures all over the world, we, 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 have, we can't afford to not see it as an emergency. So, I'm wrapping up now. I just want to say again, I feel like X members are like the white blood cells of the immune system of you who are doctors um, of, of the human body. Like we, we can identify authoritarianism and we're in a position to be able to help. But we have to get past the stigma of feeling ashamed, embarrassed, like it was something wrong with us. There was nothing wrong with us. We were exposed to authoritarian mind control cults. And they're not just religious cults. They're political cults, therapy cults, large group awareness training cults. Cryptocurrency is a multi-level marketing cult, in my strong opinion, by the way. There are cults that are using psychedelics and wanting everyone to get stoned so they're not going to be citizens. It's like, think about it. Like, what, what's our future? How do we want to be? And I don't know. I want to be a realist, but I want to, I want, I want to have hope and I want to give you hope. And I'm telling you, people say, how could you do this so many years? It's like, it's the most fulfilling work I could choose. It chose me in a way. And I want to do a shout out for Robert J. Lifton. Uh, does everyone know who Robert J. Lifton is? Thought reform and the psychology of totalism. I, I called him a few months after I got out. I still had a cast. I found him at Yale. I got him on the phone and said, Dr. Lifton, your book saved my life. He said, oh, which book? And I said, thought reform and the psychology of totalism. He said, that old book? <laughs> Why? And I said, well, I was in this group called the Moonies. I was recruited at Queens College. Blah, blah, blah. He said, come and see me. 
So, because I what I read in the book didn't match my experience. The eight criteria from chapter twenty two matched my experience, but the rest of it didn't. So, I wanted to explain how I was recruited, how I recruited other people, the introductory lectures, the three day, seven day, twenty one day, forty day, one hundred twenty day <laughs> workshops, etc. And I'll never forget it. I'm I'm in his his apartment on Central Park West. My leg is up in the cast, and I'm looking at him, and he has hard-covered books from the ceiling to the floor. And I'm explaining this to him, and he looks me in the eye, and he says, you know, I just know this secondhand, but you've lived it. They did it to you, and you did it to other people. And what you're describing is so much more sophisticated than what I studied in China. You need to study psychology and explain it to people like me. That's called a therapeutic reframing <laughs> for anyone who's in the business of therapy. It's like I was ashamed, embarrassed that this happened to me, and now one of the world authorities telling me I can teach them something. I can do that. And you know what? Being happy doesn't really cut it as human beings. We need to feel fulfilled. We need to have purpose. We can buy a thing and be happy for a few minutes, and then the happiness goes away. But if you do something meaningful, it gives you juice. I tell people I'm 70 years old. You don't look 70. I'm like, well, I do work out, but I'm telling you, I'm on, I'm on fumes to help as many people as I can. And I'm so proud to meet former members who become mental health professionals. Because when I got out, people like Michael Langoni looked down on ex-members. Let the professionals handle it. Really, I felt like I was a second-class citizen because I had been in a cult until I got my master's. And I'm telling you, getting the PhD, I got smarter. And now people call me doctor. Feels good. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I want to encourage people. I want to shout out Felicia Rosario. She's going back to school. She's going to be a forensic psychiatrist. Yay. So with that, I'm wrapping up. We have 25 minutes of questions and answers. And um, thank you for listening.